Hi, welcome to Morning Talk Show. Today is my conversation with Mark Vernon. Um, it was a momentous conversation for me because Mark is the first return guest to uh, Morning Talk Show. Um, the first time we talked about his amazing book, The Secret History of Christianity. Um, this time I actually brought him a topic I wanted to discuss, um, which was basically human motivation. We get into morality and that kind of thing and moralism. Um, as always, Mark is a really interesting conversationalist. He is a, a philosopher, and he's one of those people whose spirituality comes out in, in just everything he says, and yet it's, it's an inspirational kind of aspirational uh, spirituality. It's not, it's not dogmatic, and dare I say, it's not even religious in a, in a, in a weird way. So he's, he's really into Dante's Inferno, and he's really into William Blake and these kind of visionary thinkers, uh, visionary, but also kind of, um, kind of wild thinkers who, um, you know, who, who really get, go to some interesting and, and, and dark, strange places. So I love talking to Mark. Um, I'm hoping that it's still not the last time he's on the show. Um, so please, um, like, and subscribe. If you want to hear more of these kinds of conversations about kind of deep, uh, issues like human motivation. Um, if you're on an audio, um, if you're listening on an audio platform, please subscribe. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mark Vernon returning to Morning Talk Show. Um, so uh, I guess I'll just say, Mark Vernon, welcome back to Morning Talk Show. Uh, thank you for being my first return guest. That's unbelievably exciting to me. Uh, well, thank you very much. No, it's nice to be back. Thanks for asking me again. Oh, yeah, well, no, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's more, it's more um, for some of the people I've talked to, it's more a matter of restraining myself from asking too much <laughs> than asking again. I mean, the, the, you, yourself and, um, and John Verveke and uh, who have been on the show are people that are, uh, I, they cont you continue to be kind of a well for me to go back to, to, uh, to hone and strengthen what I've been um, what's, what's been on my mind. And it's an, it's a wonderful combination of you being, uh, a feeling, uh, you know, aligned with you, but also challenged. And so it's, yeah, your, your work is, is very important to me, um, personally. So, uh, I'm so nice to have you back. And, and, um, this is a different, uh, approach than last time. The last time we spoke, I had, um, finished your book like the day before and was kind of full of, uh, thoughts spurred on by that um and this time i was uh, thinking of doing more of a more of a dialogue um to get your impressions and my responses to your impressions on on a topic um if that's okay with you um i know it's something you do um with much mm. greater minds than myself so uh um oh, no, please these things are teased <laughs> out between minds the, oh i love the dialogue it is all important so it's yeah not like that really and, and and I do. I mean, I, I always want to treat myself as a, um, you know, a, a partner in the conversation. I'm not uh, uh, being unnecessarily deferential, but um, uh, it, 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 it's very nice to speak to someone uh, like yourself. I was thinking recently, actually, how I think I tweeted you about it, uh, about uh, um, how we have stereoscopic vision and, you know, stereo field hearing and how the two, um, you know, the two sense organs um, add all of like the literal depth that we experience in the world, like the spatial depth that we experience in the world. And that, uh, uh, conversation may be, a, a a form of, of that in the, you know, in the internal world or in, in consciousness, right. A, ter a, t a type of stereoscopic, uh, vision, um, in, in the internal world. And, and I mean, we don't have 15 eyes, uh, we have we have two, so I, I like I like dialogue for that reason and conversation. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I see it um, because I think really at the end of the day, it's about trying to listen in to truth or to knowledge or awareness. Um, And so very often it's good to have two people at that, partners as it were, because then it makes possible for a kind of third perspective to come into view. Yeah, um, it was shared. Um, you know, that's that's the that's the meaning of dialogue. Very um, much so. Because ultimately, it's about trying to listen in and discern um, and perceive, um, rather than just somehow magically produce things from yeah. within isolated consciousnesses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like uh, I, it's like uh, I'm going to serve you m- the best data in my head, and you serve me the best data in in, in my head, and we'll go away and process that. I, I, that's a, a very dead form. Um, and anyway, uh, so the topic that was on, on my mind and uh, for kind of personal and emotional reasons, as much as anything, um, that I wanted to sort of wade into with you was originally it was about motivation, uh, human motivation and what spurred it on were a couple of things, a personal story and, uh, um, and then things in the news, um, when I I had, um, I personally had a a disagreement, a a quite fundamental disagreement with a family member. um, And uh, at at a certain point, it was leveled at me that I had basically, um, I had basically done something terrible by um, having a certain conversation. And, uh, and I, I, I said, well, I mean, you must know that my motivations, you know, were, in love like i've i've been as you know uh, um as loving as i can and and my motivation truly is love and and the the answer came back it doesn't matter what your motivations are and uh for me that that was it was very like it was the most hurtful thing i mean all of the all of the posturing and everything that happens in an argument between both parties is is one thing but then uh, to, to hear that was, was very hurtful. Uh, and then I guess fast forward a bit to the era of, um, you know, people losing their livelihoods over, uh, over comments and things like that. And, um, there was an artist called Ariel Pink. Uh, this is a, this is just such a tiny little, um, blip in all this going on now politically and everything, but he was, he's a musical artist that I really enjoy. And he attended, the Trump rally on January 6th and, uh, and uh, t- tweeted or, or whatever, Instagrammed uh, himself in the hotel, not even at the rally, um, in the hotel in DC saying he was there to go to the rally. And he has lost his, his record deal. And, and, uh, and so anyway, with the musicians that I know, because I'm a musician, we ended up talking about it online. And, and I was saying like, um, look, I know it's not like, I don't, I don't support Trump and everything, but he was there. And, and I know that this, this particular artist is kind of a troll. Like he's, he's, he's rebellious and he's kind of, he's always throwing things in people's faces to see what reactions he gets and starting fake beefs with people online and that kind of thing. And I, I I have to admit that I love, I actually love that, (laughs) that I love, I love the rebellious spirit in a sense. And so I was saying like, okay, like, everybody's reaction is their own. And I know that Trump's actions have hurt many people and, and really disillusioned many people. And, and so without saying that, I mean, it, it is quite with, without contradicting that it is quite possible that he was there, uh, you know, as a troll or whatever. And I got the same thing saying, it doesn't matter. Uh, like it, it doesn't matter what your motivations are. And um, you know, this is a dangerous thing to do and he's done something evil. And so I, I really, um, I really realize that when it comes to morality, and I'm sorry, this is such a monologue, um, but I'm just kind of setting the stage. When it comes to morality, I feel like I could talk all day long about how we've got morality wrong and attack moralism, um, but it becomes very difficult to know where to draw that line in in actuality, like with actual people in your life. And I know, like on, a, uh, I guess I'm just wondering. Uh, my, my question probably goes pretty deep into the heart of like what morality is to um, Western culture and, and where it might be wrong and, and how we might begin the road to, uh, 
to some kind of morality that isn't moralism. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. What's your initial thought? Yeah. You have one? Well, it's a big, big issue. And as you say, it feels like it's we're out of control in quite large parts of the culture, both on this side of the Atlantic in the UK and in the US. Um, I think that it can be helpful, though, to realize first that the idea of morality is actually a very recent thing. Um, we think morality is timeless and people must have always angst over moral questions, but really it's a modern idea in the way that we think of it as primarily about doing the wrong or the right thing. Mm. Because before, say, the 17th century and figures like Kant um, or Jeremy Bentham that invented what's called deontological ethics, which is the kind of I must do this kind of ethics, or the doing the right thing because it has the best consequences, which is more utilitarian, utilitarian. ethics, Jeremy Bentham. They're, they're, they're about three or 400 years old. But before then, the idea was very different, which was that it was really about cultivating your character so that you had the right qualities of personality or virtues, as it's normally put now, um, in order to resonate as fully as possible with reality around. And the idea, if you read someone like Dante in the Divine Comedy, is that Dante, as he ascends, has to inhabit more and more the right qualities because those are the qualities that resonate with the cosmos and because they resonate, enable him to see more and more of the cosmos. Mm. So old style virtue is not just about who you are, it's about who you are in order that you can see more and more. Mm. Um, and so that's a sort of expansive um, notion of consciousness, I'm sorry, of, of virtues based in consciousness that is shared across the cosmos. Mm. You know, and ultimately it would have been a religious view, of course, um, in a time where people uh, felt very uh, alive to God. Mm. Um, whereas what happened at the birth of modernity was that starts to come into question, that cosmology starts to come into question. And so the question is, how can we devise methods which try and keep people good, but without the kind of bigger goal of what goodness might be about, which is to mm. know the good, the beautiful and the true in itself in God. Right. And so you get this contraction. So um, nowadays, morality is thought of as these, you know, as many monads as there are people on the planet, each with mm. their own right to do what they think is good or, or wrong. Mm. Um, and it becomes a battle. Um, and so then you get kind of secondary battles like people provoking just to see what happens, as you were describing. Mm. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's going nowhere because it's lost this wider reference. You know, morality, put it like this, morality is not an end in itself. It should be a means to another end, but we've lost mm. what that end might be. And mm. so that's a kind of history of ideas, if you like, way of accounting yeah. for what is going so badly wrong now. Right. So I guess what, what you're saying, and it's in line with your book, is that um, human beings um, at, at an earlier phase of history, before, your, before Bentham and such, um, their, their default was that in some way they were part of a bigger reality, that um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a matter of um, having to stimulate belief in that in that larger reality. It was just, they, they were already a part of that larger reality and their moral, um, their moral strivings, I guess, would be uh, just to kind of better, better harmonize with that larger reality. But the larger reality itself was not so harshly and specifically defined maybe. Is that, is that a thing? Yeah, so, you know, morality and, and, and ethics in their origins mean basically character. Mm. Um, so then your character is about how you're sitting in the world, um, both in the relation to others, of course, and not just in relation to the divine, um, but it has this kind of outward imperative, not this, I'm isolated, I'm responsible for my moral behavior that I've got to judge by myself, um, and which inevitably starts to feel very conflicted when it's challenged. Mm. Um, and, the, you know, you see this manifest in another way where morality is normally talked about now in relation to particular issues. You know, like, are you for and against abortion? Are you for and against gay right. marriage? Yes. Um, and, you know, that, that's 
already only going to go one way, which is lead to conflict, because some people are going to say one thing, some people are going to say the other. Right. And there's no bigger space within which to assess these otherwise very particular issues. So the tension that I'm I'm feeling, because I, I fully ag agree with what you're saying, but the tension that I'm feeling in it is um, the the whether or not morality is a construct like uh, or, or or whether or not it's real because it, on the one hand um we're saying like i, I guess I, I guess you're saying like morality is kind of a transcendent ideal that it's something that's beyond um and so that um our actual human moral systems uh would be kind of constructed by us but as you know, with sort of a, a spiritual element to, to acknowledge that they are constructed by us in order to attempt to reflect, uh, uh, to, to help us to live out uh, a larger um, transcendent concept that we can't actually embody uh, through a system of rules. Is that, is that kind of Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd put it slightly different, perhaps, in that um, I think that in the pre-modern world, your virtues, the qualities of your character, your habits, ultimately were felt to be absorbed from the world around you. Um, mm. So, you know, you could become loving because there was such a thing as love that was woven right. into the fabric of all things. Right. Um, you could become good because goodness could be kind of felt on the air, if you like, mm. in the spirit of all things. And so that's why it's this question of resonance and chiming and people got it wrong. Um, this is the people obviously weren't perfect at all. Um, but the reference was very different. Right. Um, you know, a, a sort of shorthand way of putting it, which is halfway there is that you were responsible for yourself before God, not mm. you weren't responsible for yourself before yourself, which is the modern understanding. Mm. Right. Um, so it's, it's a kind of a question of resonance. So it's why Aristotle, when he writes about virtue, says that the way to cultivate virtue is actually by making mistake. Because when you make a mistake, you feel it in your soul, a kind of contraction or an error. Mm. And then that gives you this felt perspective that enables you when you next do the same thing to try and, you know, a, a different move, as it were, to see whether it expands your soul and you feel more commensurate with reality. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what justice was. Justice was a kind of harmony with all things. It, mm. And again, it's very different from the modern sense of justice, which is my rights pitted against your rights. Yeah. Um, so all these words, which look like they're the same and constant across time, really aren't at all. Mm. And that's it. That's that's an interesting thing. You, the whole element of the of the conversation that you bring up is, yeah, like the two things that come to mind. One is that the these transcendent ideals, um, their definitions begin to fudge and blur the more kind of open and uh, sort of existential you make them, the more or ontological or whatever, the more they, the more they are coming from the fabric of, of the reality and, uh, uh, that we experience and from you know larger consciousness and all that, the more it becomes difficult to tell the difference between justice and virtue uh you know and knowledge and and well morality in the in that larger sense um so that that is really interesting and it also um it, it, it's also the the definitions of of words um come to mind as something that maybe is another um another barrier that we reach in modern society quite often a barrier in conversation and a barrier um, in action is that um, we words have have definitions and that's something that you know especially people on the conservative on the more conservative end of things lo love to say is like we're changing the definitions of words you know and and uh, and, and that's almost seen as like a, a sacrilegious act but then you have these words like spiritual or like justice or like goodness righteousness morality that um are so the concepts are so big that it, it feels like there is a need to continue pushing into what they mean uh, as our as our societies evolve and all of that does that make sense mm -hmm. 
Again, well, I think that a lot of this arises from a modern conception of what's true, um, which similarly has kind of collapsed in on itself. So that now the assumption would be that you work out what's true by say use of reason, which is a self-consistent, self-contained undertaking of human minds. So they might dialogue about it and they might try and put together arguments and defend the position, but ultimately it exists within a kind of closed universe of human minds using this one tool like logic, a bit like you might you know, try and probe the physical universe. Physics is yeah. the kind of standard for all things. Right. Whereas in the pre-modern world, um, human beings weren't thought just to have reason, but they were also thought to have what was called intellectus in the medieval world, which was, um, you know, clearly kind of translates as, as, as intellect, but it's lost some of its meaning again. And it's, it's more, it's, it's, it's some, some of the older sense is still captured in the sense of, of intelligence, kind of wisdom, know-how a kind of felt sense of how to make your way through life. So, so mm. if you think, if you say someone's got good emotional intelligence, um, it's not that they can reel off 10 commandments about how to behave, but right. you know that they'll respond well in any particular situation. Yeah, even and in so, ambiguity. Again, it's that kind of much more open um, antenna sort of approach to knowledge rather than closed, I can nail it and pin it down if only I get the right argument notion um, towards knowledge. Mm. And what that means is that you use different criteria for judging someone's intelligence. And so, for example, criteria like beauty will come in um, because beauty is a kind of steer, like an inner compass. Are you more or less pointing in the right direction? And when you are, someone seems more beautiful to you. Mm. You kind of want to be like them. You, you see a kind of integrity to what they're doing. Mm. Um, even if it's not always completely obvious why they're doing what they're doing, right. it draws you mm. towards them. Yeah. Um, and that's very different from a kind of deracinated, um, I can find fault in your position and so attack it. Mm. Um, and that's not to say again that all people were beautiful in the same way. Um, you know, one person's moment where they act beautifully might be very different from someone else's moment where they act beautifully, mm. but it just leaves a bit more space because actually you can have people disagreeing at one level, but still recognize that they're aspiring to greater truth. Yeah. So life has this more kind of dialectical quality right. rather than monodimensional quality again. Yeah. So again, it, it didn't go perfectly before the modern period, um, but I think it was a richer understanding that paradoxically um, makes more space for difference because everything is seen to be aspiring to that which right. exceeds what we can comprehend anyway. So in a funny yeah. sort of way, you actually need difference right. in order that everybody has um, the best chance of seeing what's most beautiful, good and true. Right. Yeah, no, no that's true. And I think if we think about it, we all know someone who doesn't correspond with how we would, you know, maybe even a frustrating person who doesn't correspond with uh, how we would want things to be done. But you also see that there is some kind of life in what they're doing. You know, there's some kind of connection to something and, and their their work or their just their presence has that feeling where you you just instinctually forgive the difference between you. And uh, um, yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. And I, I think you're bringing in the kind of the non the inarticulate parts of of human experience into the into the idea of of morality and goodness and 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 knowledge and and all of that which is i mean very much in line with what i'm thinking like these these always become spiritual issues like i i had absolute confidence that if I talk to you about them, you would not get into the nitty gritty of, uh, uh, you know, right and wrong, like, you know, catechismic, uh, which is my new word for the day that I just made up uh, of, of catechismic morality. Um, and yet, man, it's such a it's such a big um, ask these days, you know, to to. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's it, it might be my project in life to um, to to try and and transmit um, 
and highlight the yearning for these uh, non non articulate or inarticulate and I don't mean that they don't communicate but these things that don't use words in our experience like like beauty and 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 art and um, and spirituality um, and even a even a even a rethink of of, of epistemology of, of what knowledge is um, and and I guess what what I come up against and, and I don't know if you come up against this too is just how difficult it is to uh, just to just to get these these ideas across to uh, people for whom they're not already naturally like you know my brain just goes this way I'm, I'm kind of useless in a lot of things and some of the people who I would have like you know a conversation with a, a you know a, uh, an animated conversation with about kind of trying to describe what spirituality might be or or what uh, you know, uh, a broader idea of, of morality. These conversations are, are very difficult and, uh, and especially on a larger level. Uh, have you, have you found that to be, I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you have to look for ways of trying to show as much as tell. Um, so for example, you know, if you think of, um, the great, what we might think of as moral exemplars in our time. So like a figure like Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela mm. um, say. Now, the minute you start to look at that, you realize that you're not talking about people that never made mistakes. And um, they can, all these kind of great exemplars, um, fault can be found with them. And indeed attempts can be made to cancel them, no doubt, nowadays. Um, but the reason why they're thought of as moral greats is because there was a kind of radiance in their life um, that was more important, more significant than uh, mistakes that they made uh, at mm. various times. Yeah. And that shows up because they enabled movements that seemed to transcend what was looking like an inevitably destructive situation. So particularly say the end of apartheid in South Africa, um, that there was something about Nelson Mandela's very presence that enabled um, that country to move into a new phase, still troubled, of course, but nonetheless move into a new phase without, I'm old enough to remember, people thought that the end of apartheid would be a civil war in South Africa and there'd be mass bloodshed. Now, there's a lot of trouble in the country, but it didn't turn out like that. And, and closer to home for here us in the UK, something similar is often said about the situation in Northern Ireland, um, that part of the reason why um, there was the Good Friday Agreement, which you know, it's, 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 it needs securing, it needs protecting, it's not um, um, unvulnerable. But part of the reason why it came about was because of David Trimble, who was mm. able to project a, a quality of aspirational vision um, that enabled people to look beyond what originally had so locked them in mortal combat. Um, mm. So you need to look, I think, for examples like that. Um, and then people feel it. Mm. Um, and when they when you get a sort of a, a, a smell of it, if you like, you realize how much more appealing it is humanly. Um, I mean, I guess that, you know, you might say a lot of novels do this. Uh, maybe, you know, so tell people to read a good novel rather than read a philosophy book about the rights or wrongs of this, that and mm. the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they might actually learn more that way. Um, yeah. I guess a lot of movies and films, um, they can be sentimentalized, of course, but the imperative is the impulse is right. Yeah. Um, that it's. Um, the sense of someone's life that often matters much more than the ups and downs of their life. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And, and uh, yeah, pointing people to, uh, to great uh, works of art and things like that. And great exemplars is, is a good idea. You, you did a video on soul on, on uh, Disney's soul. And, and I mm. think that was, that was a really, I mean, that one, that that's very dense. Like if you, if you unpack what that, what that movie actually meant it almost it might almost be too dense because there's so much there um but okay yeah that those are good those are good uh those are good thoughts um so uh this is all this is all good and and i'm, I'm wondering um if we can uh briefly discuss like what what moralism uh, might mean to you and and how to how to kind of express that concept because I've uh, 
related to these thoughts and feelings that I've had, I've kind of been having a bit of a conversation uh, with people on moralism. Um, and, uh, and my sense is that it's, it's a toxic force. And um, I actually didn't expect there to be anyone who would even argue with the concept of moralism being a bad thing. Like I, but, but I have received some argument about it, you know, like, oh, moralism, it's too broad of a term and, and all of that kind of thing, which kind of is troubling to me. So what is your sense of, of what moralism would even be? I mean, I think that it, it doesn't quite go away, even when you point out to people that it's only going to lead to conflict um, and to one person accusing another or one person trying to provoke another. I think the reason, part of the reason anyway, again, to come straight back to a sort of spiritual point or religious point is that so much Western religion anyway, and certainly Western Christianity is based on moral ideas that you're supposed to do the right thing or you feel so guilty about what you've done that you somehow need to seek some kind of um, Absolution. relief from that guilt. So, you know, very widely read apologists for Christianity say, the kind of religion I know the best, present it in that way. So like C.S. Lewis's moral, Christ uh, mere Christianity, one of the best-selling apologists of, for Christianity, it begins by saying, um, we're all failures, we're all, make terrible mistakes and left to ourselves, we deserve to be condemned. Um, and if you set things up like that, um, then moralism is only gonna ensue. And I think that it's, 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 it's wildly mistaken because as William Blake put it, um, you know, the, the, the thinker that I think is absolutely crucial because he comes right at the beginning of this modern period when these things were beginning to get set in and he spotted them right from the get-go. He, he said, look, forgiveness is the starting point. It's like the first square in Christianity. You are forgiven. The question is how you're now going to live. Mm. It's not, do you feel how bad you are? How right. are you possibly ever going to find relief from that yeah. sense of condemnation? Um, mm. And so, um, you know, I, I, I put all the blame on modern Christianity, but Part of the trouble is, is that even <laughs> sort of wide, even widespread, even um, many lead, Christian leaders that I know can't think of religion in any other way apart yeah. from the relief of sins. And it's partly right. because if they go to church, um, the whole service week by week, almost day by day is set up with how are you going to find forgiveness of your sins? Well, um, it's, it's, a, it's deeply ingrained in, in Christian culture. And it's um, also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, but, but the, you know, just to put the sort of the flip side, um, uh, what is forgotten is that um, we have the good within us, and that can't be um, spoiled any more than God in God's self can be spoiled. Mm. Um, it can be veiled, it can be lost, it can be mistaken, and so on. Um, but uh, it seems to me that a, the crucial thing is to help people to see what's good in themselves. Um, I mean, I think that psychotherapy, you know, which is sort of my day job, um, I work as a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. um, that's sort of the assumption which we make. People come very troubled and sometimes having done terrible things, um, but you immediately say, Look, let's try and understand this. And you try and understand it in order that then you can see around it and more than what mm. seems to be completely um, blocking their view. And that's where relief is found. Um, on the assumption that we want to be good, not that we are bad and are somehow trapped in that predicament right. without yeah. some sort of outside intervention. Yeah, that whole, are we good or bad? Like like the light switch method uh, of, of determining human humanity is so, is, is so toxic. And yeah, and for some reason does come from, is, is so strengthened by the, the Christian, the modern Christian message, which is so like so strange. And, and I think, I mean, it's also another thing that, that really saddens me about, about modern day Christianity is that it, uh, it does not take a whit of, um, of the blame or, or any um, sense of mission in the solution to the problem of moralism. I mean, the, the, you know, I, I feel, I feel for people, you know, now that, um, 
now that Christianity's voice is declining and other voices are rising and, and new kind of movements and, and loosely associated groups of people now have um, a voice in society and a powerful voice, um, you know, I feel badly for them because they don't realize how deeply they've internalized that what was in the air all around them o- over the development of Christianity in the West, which is this moralistic uh, framework. And, and uh, you know, you almost wish that everyone could step out, just step out of reality for a minute. Everybody sit down at some desks. We're going to like, we're going to talk about what it means to, to, to be a human being. And, and, and then you can go back to your same fights and, you know, take your same, take your same stance and just fight it righteously. And let's see where we end up. I, you know, I think it would be somewhere good. Obviously you can't do that, but um, yeah, that's, that's something that, I mean, it would be very insulting to a lot of people to hear that the moral, that they inherited their moral stance from Christianity, no matter how much they may have transitioned over into uh, you know, outspoken atheism, they've still got this moralism at the heart of it, which is kind of, or, or, or they think the only other alternative is actual nihilism. And, and I think we do see a lot of people attempting to live out some kind of coherent, ni- loving nihilism. Do, do you know what I mean? Or like, it's, it's, I don't think it's actual nihilism, but, you know, people who will greet you with, uh, you know, how are you doing? Well, you know, pretty good. Life is meaningless. Uh, and I'm trying to, uh, you know, just trying not to harm anybody. So how are you doing? You know, kind of thing. Um, so that I, this is what I love about the, the, the way that you articulate spirituality is that it seems to, uh, I mean, you're, you're a confusing guy cause you don't seem religious at all to me. And yet everything becomes spiritual <laughs> when, when, when it's talked about. And I think everything is spiritual and, and, there's this massive, uh, I don't know, there, there's this, there's this massive hole in, in society, um, the spiritual hole. And, and, um, lots of people are religious, but not spiritual. Lots of people are spiritual, but not religious. And, but I don't know, I, I'm ranting now, but a, a thought that came to my mind, uh, today, uh, as I was thinking about this, I mean, I was, wasn't awake for super long before this It's early here, but, um, was about the story of Jesus, actually, um, and how one way you could view that story is um, that uh, it removes, like, if, if you kind of believe the spark of the story, the whatever's at the bottom of it, not the his- historicity or whatever, but it kind of removes the ability to create a binary between the overarching transcendence and the, and the individual like it, you know, because in a lot of systems, you know, Christianity and socialism and all kinds of things, the, I, you know, they, they're kind of somewhat sometimes predicated on the idea that the large transcendent overarching um, idea or society or God or whatever is the thing. And the human being, if they have any worth at all, it is, simply um, as a cog in that, in that wheel or as a small constituent, uh, a microscopic atomic particle in that overall um, goal or towards that overall goal. And I feel like um, that's one of the reasons that, I, uh, that this Jesus has always been compelling to me, no matter where my religious faith is, uh, is because it's like, no, no, uh, okay, um, how, how much more clearly can we spell this out in a non-moralistic way? It's like God is, is here as a human being and then died, but left his spirit with you, in you. Um, and, you know, uh, and it's, com- I mean, it's complicated, but does that resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, well, actually, to, to be maybe uh, a little bit more religious sounding. Um, <laughs> but as you talk there, I was reminded that uh, today, which is a Sunday on which we speak, and, and thanks very much for rising early in the morning so that I could have a comfortable time in the afternoon to speak with you. Um, but the, it's in the afternoon here, and this morning in many churches, um, the, the, the reading set for today, certainly in Catholic churches, Anglican churches, is, is, the, is the story of the transfiguration. 
and it's not the feast of the transfiguration that comes later in the year but uh, the, the gospel story for today happens to be the feast of the, of the story of the transfiguration mm. and that is normally told in my experience um as this individual isolated separate exceptional figure jesus suddenly showing his individual isolated exceptional reality as divine and so shines forth in the story of the transfiguration but i think it means something really very different which is that the transfiguration was the moment when peter james and john realized that what they saw so clearly in the figure of jesus was actually also true of them that the divine mm. being and presence could shine forth in them as well mm. and i think that explains why they first of all see moses and elijah because as good jews um moses and elijah were two figures who were known to have shone with the divine presence yeah. you know Exemplars. moses yeah. famously had to cover his face because he shone with the divine presence and elijah was taken up into heaven on a fiery chariot and elisha his successor couldn't follow the rising chariot into the sky so moses and elijah were known to them also as shining too brightly with the divine presence as jesus was and then they say shall we make some tabernacles right which is a kind of um sort of uh spontaneous impulse that's sort of true and wrong because of course the yeah. tabernacle is a dwelling place um they sort of think they know they've got to make dwelling places <laughs> but what they don't quite clock in that moment anyway is that the dwelling places are of god is them too right um and so the whole story is communicating what for me is the truth of the incarnation which isn't that there's this massive gap between ourselves and jesus but that jesus precisely shows the opposite that there's no gap at all and that we can become the manifest dwelling places of the divine even as we already are mm. um which the transfiguration um you know foretells as it were yeah. makes makes explicit mm, interesting um, yeah, I love that, and, and and you can almost see the um, uh, the t the three dwelling places. Uh, you know, let let's make tabernacles for for the three of you. You could almost see them as as our human systems that we want to make to contain uh, to contain these ideas. You know, uh, and, and then and it and it's the beginning of a, it can be the beginning of a problem for us when we try to make a home uh, to to make a a, a sort of dwelling place on on earth in our conception uh for these holy figures uh, i mean that that's that's really interesting no i mean the reversal happens all the time so you know as you say they think the tabernacles are for the three figures in front of them when the tabernacles is actually for the three of them um mm. the way that people use church you know church is where people go to find god um right. whereas really church is the building that we inhabit um as um the children of god right as as, as kin of god in a way um, it's it's a in a way it's done out of a weakness uh, because we can't we can't find god everywhere god is uh and so we we go to this place to hopefully pool our resources and say where did well did you find god where did you find god you know like yeah so yeah it's not a place it's not a dwelling place for god um well that's um yeah I think that, you know, in a way, the fundamental mistake of, of modern Christianity is this assumption that what we need is kind of out there. It's somewhere different. Uh, you know, in, in forms of Protestantism, they would say that God is infinitely distant from us. And that's why a kind of infinite sacrifice needs to be made to try and bridge the gap. Um, and um, it, it, it's, com it's completely mistaken. And again, um, the, the medieval world and before is so interesting because they, not because they got it right in every respect but because right. it's so different from us and so casts yeah. what we um think in some sort of um light mm -hmm. but a key word there for figures like thomas aquinas and others would have been participation they would say you're already participating in the life of god how can it be otherwise because god is the source of all life and sustains it moment by moment mm -hmm. if you weren't within god then you would have already fallen out of existence altogether Mm. But the question is, how are you going to align yourself more and more to what's already the case? That right. Participation with the divine. Right. And and there's uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really love that. And I, I love this idea that I mean, goodness itself, like righteousness, to put it in more religious terms, is like so exhausting when you feel that it comes from yourself 
and that you, you you're filling up a tank and then you're it, emptying that tank into the world or something like that. Whereas what you're describing is more of this uh, reality infused with goodness and, uh, and, and we can, we, we're privileged to, to take part in, in that uh, and, and that we can find the places where are, for some reason we most align uh, with um, the, the, the work of, I, I, I like to call it life sometimes rather than, rather than goodness, but the work of actual life um, around us. And we get into, you know, when, when we, when we really feel our passions aroused or, or our, you know, our love, um, our love stimulated, um, or, you know, then we're being drawn into something and, 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 and people, everyone does it. That's the thing. It's not, I, I really resent the, the notion, uh, the religious notion that everybody's experience of good is, is some hollow shell until you um, join that particular club or, I mean, and, and it's, it, it, but it's also, I mean, it's also true of non-religious institutions where um, to, to ch kind of pull it back into where we were, what we were originally talking about. Um, it's like, um, you know, uh, someone who is, is on the far left would, if they have the wrong attitude about it, would not realize that a white supremacist person might go when their kid is having a hard time, might creep in into their kid's bed, put their arms around them and, and hold them until they go to sleep. You know what I mean? <laughs> like these things that we do out of love and these, these ways that we protect life happen um, because they're, just undeniable, you know, there, and, and it really takes a huge effort and negation, um, you know, and, and, and just this yawning, gaping chasm of nothingness that's be, that you have to work very hard to stimulate in yourself before you could, before you could deny, you know, some of these, these good things that, that you can do in the world. And so um, I think we can, like when we when we discuss anyone or, or 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 any issue i think that it that that is so important to remember that they are drawn to love and life you know they are um and and they've been maybe misguided more than we've been misguided <laughs> in their mm -hmm. attempt in their attempt to engage with that just that flow of, of, of life that's happening around them. And they, and, and in some ways by maybe latching onto very specific parts of what they see as righteousness, they, they have, they have blocked out, you know, some other, other things. They're, they're, they're a bird in a cage. There are certain paths that are not open to them. And, and that's a, that's a tragedy. That's uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of ranting now. Uh, no, I, I, I like the idea of uh, the use of the word li life there because goodness does unfortunately have these moral overtones which are hard to, mm. to be rid of. I mean, I, you know, I'm very keen on Dante and in Dante um, it's things like light and levity, um, levity not meaning humour, um, but the kind of capacity to rise, to look up, to, to be, mm. to expand, the kind of, it was the opposite of gravity which is, which holds you down and traps you and mm -hmm. so on. Um, so yeah. freedom, again, you know, is another really important notion and how that's changed. Um, it's become a kind of end in itself again in the modern right. world. As long as you've got freedom, it doesn't matter what it's for. Yeah. Whereas before, you know, it, it was always important to ask, what is this freedom for? And ultimately right. it's to move more and more into life. Right. Um, more and more into the divine life, ultimately. Yeah, there's um, this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Um, and, and just, you know, one further thought was about I think that um, another part of this kind of collapse um, is what politics even is for. And um, politics is now seen as a kind of salvific project um, that is <laughs> going to do what religion used to promise to do for you, which is to give you the kind of perfect life. Um, and so people inevitably become frustrated because it can't do that. Yeah, no. Um, and what gets lost is that um, our perfection, if you like, is found 
in the non-material aspects of ourselves. So we need a certain mm. minimal material base to life in order that we can live because we are biological material creatures yeah. as well. Um, but when we start to demand more and more and more from material life as if that is going to deliver us salvation, that again is creates huge problems from political conflict through to the consumption of the earth. Um, mm. So again, we need to open up um, to these other aspects of what it is to be human already. It's not like these things um, need to be invented. They're there, but we've, we've just mm. lost sight of them. And, and as you were saying earlier on, we have to work hard to articulate them and to work out how to communicate them. Although the advantage is that if you do that work, then you get a better sense of it yourself. And so we luck are able to communicate it all the better as well. Yeah. Well, you'd be becoming a redemptive uh, presence in the world is, uh, I think, uh, something that is, yeah, it, I, I think it is the way. It's a very slow, very uh, imprecise way, and it can't be institutionalized, right? Because you can't have redemptive presence school, right? Because even myself, when I sense that, if I sense that I'm having a positive impact on somebody's life, um, you just take a step to the left or the right and you, uh, and say, maybe this, maybe someone else couldn't have had this same, you know, we're not interchangeable. It's not, it's not uh, like, um, it, it, it's not like the street ministry type of, of thing where you can just, you know, lionize or, or, you know, uh, deputize everyone to do the same job. So it's, it, 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 it paints more of a picture of uh, life, opens up like a tree, uh, you know, rather than um, being created like a machine or something like that, where um, we do these, w when we do whatever goodness our limited um, consciousness can perceive or whatever small part of, of the, the life around us that we can take part in, when we do that, we're taking part in an, in, in an effort, the, the effects of which move up and out they blossom out uh and no one i mean it would actually be wrong somehow to try and say where they will end up and where they should end up where will the individual branches of this tree end up like you know it, it, and uh it it's really freeing in in a way because um it's it's so not ideological and 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 uh like you know actual actual life is so non-ideological and so kind of inherently rebellious i mean when you if you want plants to not grow up through your concrete sidewalk you've got to make that sidewalk really strong and you've got to maintain that sidewalk because life will try to get through your sidewalk you know and, and uh like and that's that's kind of how I see it. And that's, that's even why sometimes um, I have a, a soft spot for things like rebellion um, and maybe rebellion as a separate concept from uh, revolution. Um, when it comes to kind of moral change in the world, there's a place for um, people to, uh, I mean, not only is there a place for, but it's kind of an it, an irrepressible part, part of humanity that when there is a, a prohibition um, that, that, that some part of actual, the actual work of life. And this is, this is like life as a non-moral uh, concept or maybe an amoral concept is that some, something within some people in some places causes them to say, fuck you, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, th th let's try Let's do this. Like, Oh, this, this, um, I don't know. I, does this make any sense? Is there any, is there any place? I mean, I think you, I, I don't know if you can deal with morality without um, kind of having a place um, for rebellion, uh, rebellion as kind of a transcendent idea, not any specific outlet of rebellion, but you see the punk movement, you know, I think most people who've ever appreciated aggressive music understood that uh, the punk punk absolutely had to happen you know like there was nothing else that could have happened and and it was all about oh you say that human beings are this you say that my body is this you know well i'm gonna pierce it in a weird way i'm gonna make a hairstyle that you would uh you know 
that that you would never have anticipated and and, and it bought and i know that it bothers you so anyway what how does that sit with you yeah i mean i think there are kind of interventions to use a slightly cool word as in chili rather than you know like punk um <laughs> but and the, the thing about punk that i'm uh that's fascinating actually um, is that it was actually a very short-lived movement, um, barely a year, in fact, but it had this big uh, knock-on effect because mm -hmm. people responded to it. Yeah. Um, and in a way, the response was more important than the, um, the, the punk moment right. um, because then you have to work out how you are going to respond to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, to go back to your point about rebellion and revolution and, um, and all that, um, I think that the primary site of this uh, turnaround has got to be you yourself and the minute you start to insist that other people's change first is the minute it starts to go wrong mm. because then you're exporting you're projecting right. your flaws onto yeah. others and uh, which is moralism you know, you know really. what's gone what's happening you're having pogroms or you're killing people and so on I mean you know, it's very striking that the great moral leaders are the ones who are, who, who stood up and said kill me um they didn't stand up and say, kill that person over there. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's a tall um, order because, you know, you are putting yourself on the line if you go this route, which we're talking about. And um, as, as someone once summarized Christianity, um, they said that Jesus's true message was, um, if you don't love, you die. If you do love, they kill you. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that, that so, I love that. That's what's been asked of us as well as resonating with the divine and, and, and what feels um, so att attractive and appealing. Um, but of course, you know, dying to self is part of the message as well. And if you realize that this world can't deliver heaven, heaven is not a place on earth, then you realize that it will pass away, you will pass away, um, but it passes away into the life from whence it came. Mm. Um, which is easy to say, but not always easy to actually live by because it's frightening to feel that the life which is most manifest and seems most tangible to you mm -hmm. um, will one day stop. Um, but, you know, death has got to be part of this conversation as well. Um, yeah. But death properly understood as leading to greater life. Right. And not as the frightening end of it all, which we must resist at all costs. Yeah. Um, particularly if that means killing other people first. Yeah. And I think, I think we need to, uh, I agree. And, and, and I've been thinking about death because I, I've been trying to sort of make a, a sort of word picture for um, my ontology or whatever uh, and, and write one out. And, and it's clear that death is not, uh, it's clear that death is not the opposite of life. I mean, it just, you know, if death were not the opposite of life, then uh, things you know non-human things would, would live forever you know like uh, a, a wolf whose intentions are always pure and they're just a just a pure uh you know hunting killing machine would just go on and on but no they die that's part of a it's it's part of life it's part of the cycle and and it seems to be me that negation or or, or nothingness is is um is 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 where evil lives it, it's in negating the life and what is alive and, 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 and um, making it not, not alive. If that makes sense, I don't know if maybe that's mm. too, too weird of a way to phrase it, but. Well, uh, I mean, maybe it's not a million miles away from again, um, how the relationship between life and death or good and evil um, has been conceived, not as dual opposites, not in a kind of Manichaean battle to the end, um, but that, their asymmetric relationships. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I've, I sometimes have likened it to the relationship between hot and cold, um, mm. because everybody knows that cold is the absence of heat, whereas heat is not the absence of cold. Right. They have an asymmetric <laughs> relationship. Yeah, no, and that's, that's I good. I think the same is true of life and death, you know, especially when you think that life is a kind of warmth and death is a kind of coolness. So, mm. so to fall away from life is to gradually die. But death mm. is not a thing in itself. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, I think you can't actually fall away from life completely because right. otherwise right. you do just vanish into non-being. Yeah. Um, and that, that, can't ha that can't happen for, for us beings, even us transient beings. Well, um, 
Yeah, so, so and similarly with, you know, good, this is always the understanding of good and evil, that evil was the absence of good. Um, but be, right. And this is a modern psychological insight, but um, when things are absent, they have a perverse kind of presence um, mm. because the absence feels like it becomes a thing. Yeah. Um, mostly because you're fighting what you don't want or what you fear. Um, yeah. And it's you that are giving the reality to the void, to the evil, um, yeah. to the death, in fact. Um, so which is why when you can ease up on trying to um, fear it, uh, feel you've got to fight it, resist it and so on, but rather turn towards it and embrace it, mm. um, it actually disappears uh, yeah. as the fear disappears. And, and what remains is the goodness, is the life, is the heat. Interesting. Yeah, no, I love that. And even with uh, Rupert Sheldrake, it, recently you were talking about, or maybe he mentioned that because life is a wave, or sorry, life, light is a wave, there is darkness contained within light. <laughs> uh, like, but uh, a couple of po poems came to mind as you were talking, uh, of uh, one of which was a little thing that popped into my mind once. I, I, I wrote it, so forgive me. But uh, it and and you can critique it. We'll do some live literary critique. But uh, I've never said it to anyone. But the 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 line that came into my mind was, uh, "And God may call with equal voice from existence and from not uh, the what is the echoes um, echoes move around the ring of iron he himself hath wrought or something like that." Uh, and and it was sort of like this thing because I was in a I was in a phase of uh, and and forgive the gendered language there. Um, but I don't think God has a penis, but anyway, um, uh, it, it was sort of something where I was, I, I was thinking I was becoming an atheist and, and uh, um, just thought it was an, a given that I was becoming an atheist. Like I, I didn't want to or not want to, it was just like, here I go. Um, and, uh, and then it was like, no, God, you know, like for, for me, uh, when I, when I got less ideological about um, God, I found that God called as much from non-existence it's like the, the you know the need the need for the concept spoke as much as the concept had spoken or something uh you know uh, does that mm. say anything to you well it does i mean again it, i i get it takes me back to dante i um, talking of poetry um, and the divine comedy um so for example when he first wakes up in the dark wood having strayed from the path um it's quite striking that he actually sees the sun rising and then he even sees Virgil who's seen Beatrice in heaven it feels like the sun and heaven and light are quite close and yet above the gate of hell is written you know this is the way in effect mm. um and um <laughs> something deeply true about the link between descent and ascent and I think that at the end of the day, the reason why descent and ascent are so intimately linked is because we're called to know this divine light, um, not as robots that just get drawn to it, you know, kind of like moths to a flame, um, but we're called to know it fully and consciously, becoming more and more ourselves in the process. Mm. And in fact, to become more and more fully yourself is to become closer and closer to the light. Um, mm which means that you've got to look at the darkness. You've got to look at the right. shadows because, you know, like you're suggesting there, yeah. um, we are not pure light, but we're waves of light, if you like. So the right. shadow there as well. Um, so the descent down, seeing the shadow actually casts light into that darkness, which means that gradually everything becomes light. And so we become mm. more ourselves. And so descent and ascent are intimately linked. When you, when you see the... Uh... I don't know, when you spell it out this way, it seems like that there is um, that in, in a way uh, we're, we're constrained. We're constrained by uh, our consciousness and by our desires for, um, for good and our desire, like, and, and it really reframes freedom as a concept. You were talking about freedom earlier in the Western sense. And it seems to me like, um, I sense a, a person, an image came to my mind of freedom, uh, of Western freedom, is this, this person steps across a line of freedom into a gray room <laughs> and starts looking around for uh, a flat screen TV, you know, because what, what kind of freedom, freedom could, 
freedom can be a, a horrible thing because a, a lot of times we we think of freedom as like we think of freedom as as being untethered from these requirements uh you know that reality itself forget the government that reality itself is throwing at our consciousness all the time that our consciousness is perceiving these these i don't know i, I maybe i'm getting overly poetical here but uh you know the I, I do think we've got the idea of freedom wrong uh, because the way that, you know, taking part in the tree of life, taking part in the growth of, of, of actual life and reality um, is a, you know, it's, it's beyond a duty. It's not a duty in the way, in, in that way of like, I can take up this mantle if I choose. It's like, I, I can reject, I can try to reject the mantle if I choose, you know? Um, and, and so real freedom is, is not uh, what we've, what we've thought of it as, I guess, is, is where, is where my, my head goes. Um, and then the other, the other poem that came to mind was the Gayetri. Do you know the Gayetri? I, I feel like we may, I, I've talked about it a couple of times on the, on the podcast uh, and it's very Dantean. Uh, it, it's, it's an ancient, I think it's a, maybe a Hindu, um, a daily Hindu prayer. And it's, um, see if I can remember it. It's, um, Oh, thou who givest sustenance to the universe from whom all things proceed to whom all things return. Reveal to us the true spiritual sun hidden by a disc of golden light that we may do our full duty Ah, and as we journey to thy sacred feet, there's one line I'm missing, but it's really good. The, the, when I first read that, it's a prayer, obviously, but reveal to us the true spiritual sun hidden by a disc of golden light. I'm like, boom, like I, I've said it several times. I've said that prayer on the podcast a few different times because that is somehow I feel like understanding that or, or maybe even just focusing on that is, uh, it's just hugely meaningful to me. And that, and that sounds very much like a Dante or like, like a William Blake, like you're a. Yeah. Well, actually, well, living in eternity life, sunrise. Cause, yeah, yeah. Cause he said, yeah, exactly. Um, I see the holy, holy, holy and so on, not just the Guinea sun. Um, but it, it uh, I, I'm, it rem takes me back to actually um, a group that I was in um, where we read the Bhagavad Gita. Mm and I wouldn't be surprised if the prayer is linked to the Bhagavad Gita yeah. because I think what Arjuna realizes there is that his freedom lies in every moment receiving what life in that moment is giving him but offering it back immediately it's a it's, a, it's kind of a freedom it's a freedom born of receiving and offering back um, and then you find yourself being more and more in the flow of life and by mm. saying yes to life but also not holding on to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that is captured in Blake's famous quatrain, which is he who binds to himself the joy does the winged life, life destroy. destroy. He who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Yeah. So that's our freedom is to kiss the joy as it flies. Right. Um, and it's this paradox that by not feeling we possess life, we actually own all of it. Yeah. And you see that there's a Buddhist, there's a Buddhist uh, element to that too, which is one of the reasons why it's so f interesting to, to see how different religions phrase these things, because that, that whole idea of um, uh, sort of uh, what's the word, like non-attachment, um, you know, and, and kind of emptying yourself out and, and becoming nothing. It, it like, it's, um, it, it, it's very meaningful when you think of, of life presenting itself to you in this way, like, you know, it, it, experiencing life, reflecting life back or whatever, you know, and, 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 and even I, I think we have the, we have the um, capacity, like if we're, a, if we're a mirror reflecting life back to life, then we're, we're never a perfect plane, you know, we're never a perfect surface. And we always reflect it back in a way that does have maybe uh, to, to those who know us might have our stamp uh, on it in some way, but it's not, it's not an ownership. It's not an ownership thing. It's, it's, uh, it's purely about um, just the, the fact that whatever we are as an individual node of consciousness has a tone, has a, it, it is a legitimate real part of reality. You know, it is supposed to be here and, 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 uh, and has its own, kind of fingerprint 
Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and again, just, I mean, in Dante, actually also in, in the Sufi mysticism where light is a very common motif, um, a, a common image would be that, you know, we are like uh, the shards of a mirror that reflect the light according to the shape of our shard, but we're all reflecting the light. It's all mm -hmm. the one light. Um, and similarly, Dante has the same perception as he rises through the paradise that he meets um, different souls whose light is shaded, as he describes it, by the different heavenly spheres. Um, you mm -hmm. know, some have the kind of light of the moon, some the light of Jupiter, oh, some the light of Saturn and so on. Right, and I yeah. think the way of saying that they all share in the one light because there's also a part of them which is in the Imperium with the one light. But mm -hmm. um, in their individuality, it's manifest in these particular ways. I like that. I like that kind of astrological uh, uh, read on it. That's wonderful. And so I guess I, I guess that's what uh, I see uh, if, if we want to get back, you know, to kind of uh, pin things down and, and, and uh, talk about how to make uh, um, how to in, engage in the in the moral conversation. I suppose it's I suppose I, I see you doing that in the fact that you are so um, uh, present, you, you have a presence uh, in, in the world, an intentional presence. You say yes to goobers like me, uh, seven hours away in Canada. You say yes to having a conversation with me, and and the and your light, you know, well, your light, the light uh, shines through in these public um, conversations. I I really think that that is the way. And so, um, the um, to answer my own earlier question, it seems like the, you know, the way to, um, the way to combat moralism is, is to live and display these, um, these kind of um, more uh, transcendent ideals in, in a public way and to, uh, and to divorce them from, um, to divorce them from constraints and moralism and to divorce them from judgment, um, you know, to, to, to take our statements um, away from, from judgment and to just become, uh, you know, I, I think there is a growing number, there are a growing number of people, um, yourself included, who, who are, are doing that. So anyway, I don't know that we answered, I don't know that we answered the question in, in an extremely uh, uh, catechismical way. But uh, I, I think we did answer. I, I, I feel like we answered it through um, what I felt feel is a, is a connection and and, uh, and a sort of um, uh, a, a vision of life as being much greater than a moral, um, much greater than a moral system, and much greater than especially a rigid moral system. Uh, so, yeah. Anything else you have to say? No. Well, look, just again, thank you because you know these things are challenging and um you know part of what motivates me is to try and feel these things more clearly within myself and then um i find it helpful to try and talk out these things with others as well so the chance mm. to talk through these things um is you know mutually to to learn and you hear yourself saying things that you didn't say wouldn't say otherwise and, and even maybe see things that you hadn't quite seen so much before yeah. um because we're you know we're all in the service of um this greater realization at the end of the day yeah um, so we bring our struggles so and our flaws to it as much as what we can perceive and but i think yeah. you know as we were just saying when you can offer it back constantly then um it makes for the good yep and that's what you've done by being on my show and i really appreciate that um and uh and it's something i would like to to uh, model myself after something uh, so i appreciate it and uh yeah um i hope you have a great rest of your uh of your Sunday. And you too. It sounds like most of it's still ahead of you. Yes, for me it is.